given you the name of the co oh, actually it is with the email i think you have got the subject and the name of the speaker and after the speech of our vice principal sir i will introduce the speaker and our lecture will start vice principal sir please a very good afternoon uh, everyone on behalf of scottish church college uh, i very cordially welcome this webinar's speaker dr sutorshi pradhan of norwegian university of science and technology trondheim norway uh, to this webinar organized by the department of physics which is being done in collaboration with uh, the internal quality assurance cell of the college so i most cordially congratulate also my colleagues from the department of physics and also the iqvc for organizing a webinar on such a very lively and highly interesting theme now obviously i am absolutely a layman in the subject under review today but as a common man like numerous others i have experienced uh, of course earthquakes and tsunamis and as a historian i have studied how tectonic disturbances played havoc in the destiny of many ancient civilizations ancient peoples to my mind the difficulties of seismic analysis are obvious earthquake processes are inherently multi dimensional earthquake occurrence is characterized by extreme randomness the random nature of the occurrence or frequency of earthquakes in a particular region is not reducible by more numerous or more accurate measurements that's my impression adequate mathematical and uh, statistical techniques have only recently become available for analyzing earthquake data in particular such methods are still in the development stage if i am not wrong moreover it is only in the past uh, 25 30 years that the quality precision and completeness of earthquake data sets and the processing power of modern computers have become sufficient to allow detailed full scale investigations of earthquake occurrence patterns after looking at recent publications on earthquake uh earthquake physics rather one should get the impression that knowledge of earthquake process is still at a rudimentary level i may be wrong now i have two humble questions as a layman uh, why does theoretical physics still fail to explain and predict earthquake occurrence uh, occurrence and also why has progress in understanding earthquakes been so slow i am familiar with at least uh, one uh, with the name of one important Uh, scientist and scholar yan kagan who if i am not wrong compared the seismicity description to another problem in physics that is turbulence of fluids turbulence therapy deals with the most uh, ordinary and simple realities of the everyday life such as the jet of water spurting from the kitchen tap therefore the turbulence is well deservedly often called the last great unsolved problem of the classical physics i think i have come out of my domain so i hope we are going to get some interesting and provocating discussions and discourses today once again i welcome and congratulate all thank you uh, thank you very much sir being a historian but it is amazing that you have covered given the overview of the subject earthquake vividly vividly and you have raised sir very fundamental questions physicists and other material scientists i think the expert 
Dr. Pradhan today will make some comment on it. <laughs> this is the trying to uh, work out on this problem. Why this process is slow, so, so slow? And why we are uncertain to predict about the exact timings of occurrence of earthquake. I can uh, add one or two sentences regarding this. Probably in 1994, I attended a conference on earthquake. Professor G. Anantakrishna at Bangalore gave a beautiful lecture. He actually wrote a book on this earthquake modeling. modeling. There, Professor Harman was there, Professor Ru, Hans Ru was there. Hans Ru is the present director of the institute from which we are getting today Dr. Pradhan from Norway. So they also discussed about the various features of this earthquake modeling. Today we'll see, and I think Professor Pradhan will enlighten us with the question raised by our vice principal, sir. So it is customary to introduce the speaker today, Professor Dr. Pradhan, did his BSc from Ramkrishna Mission Vivekananda Centenary College, Ahura, where from I also graduated. So in that sense, we are ex-student from the same college. After that, he did his MSc from Rajabaja Science College, then PhD from Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics under the supervision of Professor Vikas Chakraborty, well known, well known to us, Vikas Da. And he came to our college also to give a lecture. I think he is the founder of economic, econophysics, econophysics. And Sutarshi, Dr. Pradhan also worked on the fracture dynamics and the flow through the porous media. He is an expert in that line. And today we are lucky enough to have Dr. Pradhan to hear something about the modeling about the earthquake. So Dr. Pradhan, please. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your very nice introduction that you really covered earthquake modeling and uncertainties and all these things. And thank you, Professor Nondi, for your introduction. Uh, first of all, I am not a professor. I am a researcher here. And I am not an expert at all in earthquake. So what you will see that is through my uh, presentations today. But let me first share my screen and open my presentation. Yes. Can you see my screen now? Can any of you please answer? Because I cannot yes, see. Yes, you. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. OK. OK. Thank you. Yes. So this is the topic of our discussion today. Uh, I, I should thank Joita for her invitation so that I get a chance to discuss these important uh, things with all of you. So the topic is earthquake modeling, physics-based approaches. So what uh, I was thinking to discuss with you, that how people thought about modeling uh, earthquake phenomena. And first, this is the outline. I want to start with observation, what we know about earthquake. The Gutenberg-Richter law and the Omori law and then what are the existing theories? We know this plate tectonic theory. Sir all, already mentioned this in his uh, speech, brief speech. And then there is some dynamic aspect like stick slip process. And then some theory, it's called self-organized criticality. And finally, one dynamics it's called fracture fault propagation. So for each of these theories, people attempted to model earthquake phenomena through 
some very simple physics based approaches so i will mention that one by one and at the final stage i will show you some micro seismic uh, experiments in the lab i mean in the lab when we do some experiment we get micro seismic events those are like earthquakes in a very very small scale and if we analyze those events what we get we can compare that with this gutenberg richter type of law whether they are still following the similar power law trend or something different and finally i'll do some concluding remark so let us move on the first one is earthquake uh, distribution of event size what we know that uh, as you can see in the figure if we collect data from entire japan uh, 1985 to 1998 there is a catalog called junek catalog so from that catalog if you plot the event frequency with size of the earthquake m is the size here in richter scale and when you plot you will get this in semi log you will get a straight line that means the event frequency they follow this equation and the right hand side the first equation log of nm is a constant minus bm but the energy released during earthquake it's related to the magnitude or size of the event and there is a equation log of energy equal to constant plus am a is a constant here and m is the size in richter scale so from these two equation we get the distribution of energy released during earthquake event and it gives us a power law ne equal to e to the power minus alpha so alpha is the exponent of this power law so these three things covers this uh, gutenberg richter law or called normally gutenberg richter law now there are uh, some terms we should know that is what is main shock what is after shock what is force shock and waiting time between two events so main shock is the highest magnitude earthquake in a set of earthquake events and after shocks the small event which comes after main shocks and there are also force shocks before main shocks sometimes we get smaller earthquakes those are called force shocks and the time between two events earthquake events are normally called waiting time so there is a, a law called omori law for after shocks so after a big earthquake there are a lot of uh, after shocks but those after shocks they follow a decaying pattern as you can see from this curve here uh, number of events and days after main shock so those are the statistics of after shocks and they are decaying so the formula is nt proportional to 1 by t so as time goes on this activity they are dying and becoming zero at some point so gutenberg richter law and omori law for after shocks those are almost i can call celebrated laws in this field now i come to plate tectonic theory so this theory says that below earth crust we have several plates solid plates and there are plate boundaries as you can see in this cartoon that japan around japan this is the japan island marked here and the left side we have eurasian plate and the right side we have pacific plate and japan is uh, just near this plate boundary that's why there are a lot of activities seismic activities around japan because these plates they are moving sometimes and this movement is coming due to the 
flow of magma. I mean, in the, in the molten stage, there are a lot of convective flows inside this, in the core of Earth. And that force is driving these plates. But this is not like a uh, continuous uh, movement. Sometimes, because these are heavy blocks of rocks, so most of the time they are sticking together. But sometimes this frictional sticking is not enough to resist the driving force and this slips. And during that slips, this all the energy release and uh, coax are coming. So that is called plate tectonic theory. Now, based on this theory, people try it to develop some physics model. So this is called fractal overlap models. On the left hand side, as you can see, this is another cartoon that two rough plates. One is our plate and another is our earth crust. And there are joints here, overlaps between two uh, rough surfaces. And when one surface moves from another, so there are overlap area and this overlap area where this elastic energy is growing over time. So when sleep occurs, that energy should be proportional to the overlap area between these two surfaces. So that, that is the physical assumptions here. So we have two rough surfaces. One is moving over another. And if we can measure the statistics of this overlap area, I mean, the distribution of overlap area, can you get, get something like this Gutenberg Richter type of law? That was the question posed and people developed this fractal overlap model. So here I have given two examples. The first one is Cantor set. So it's a different generation of Cantor set, as you can see, n equal to one, and then n, n equal to two, we remove one third of the middle part of this line. Is in, this is in 1D. And then in the next step, all these two parts, we take it and then do the same thing. We remove one third in the middle. So that's how we we create different generation of Cantor sets. Now, after this, if we place one Cantor set over another, so they are now two fractals and we move one over the another and each time step we measure the overlap size. That is one very simple approach on Cantor sets. And another one is Sierpinski gasket, num uh, leveled at C. So we generate this gasket. It's also have a fractal nature. So the dimension is not uh, like uh, integer here. If you change the length scale, the mass of the object changes with a uh, fraction, fractional dimension. Uh, this is a two in 2D, so it's less than two, the fractional dimension. Now, if you put one gasket over another and do the same, I mean, you move in one time step, you move it and then calculate the overlap area, what you'll get. You see here, the next page. Overlap size with time. This is for Cantor's Cantor set, yes. And if we plot the overlap size distribution here, as you can see, M is the overlap size, PM is their distribution. And in different sets means in different generation of Cantor set. So if you increase the generation, you'll get steeper curves like this. So in the right hand side of this curve, all these curves, they follow power law with exponent beta, and this beta is actually related to the fractal dimension of this object. So what we believe that if we go to a very high generation number, this uh, peak will shift towards zero, so we'll get a nice power law for the entire period. So this very simple model at the end is giving us 
a Gutenberg Richter type of power law that if we consider energy release is proportional to overlap area, then yes, overlap area is actually giving us a power law distribution. The next, uh, another type of model, it's called Barijnopov model by the name of the people who introduced it. Uh, and this is, uh, this model actually tried to capture the stick slip motion between these plates and crust. As, as I mentioned, they are not moving always. They are sticking most of the time, but sometimes they are missing, moving. So that's called stick slip motion. So they introduced this model with uh, spring and blocks. As you can see in the first picture. So springs, uh, these uh, blocks are attached with springs and there is a velocity, I mean a force that is pulling the, these blocks through the springs. And the functional form of this uh, friction, because there must be a friction between the blocks and the surface. And this friction is called velocity weakening friction. Uh, as you increase the velocity, this friction will go down. This is what uh, we normally expect. So with this type of setup, if you simulate a model and plot the energy with time, so we, you are pulling the system and sometimes the one or two blocks are moving. And if you pull further at some time, most of the blocks or the whole setup, they will move. That is the biggest event. That is the largest uh, magnitude event here. But before that, there will be small slips with only few blocks moving. So if we plot this, in the inside, you can see two sets of this uh, pulling event. So there are small events here and then a large event when most of the blocks or all the blocks are moving. And again, we start from the beginning. We are pulling slowly and getting almost all the blocks moving. Now, if we plot the size, oh, sorry, the size, I mean, how many blocks are slipping at the time step of our pulling? you will get uh, what this one, okay, you will get a power law here. So if you plot log n by n zero, n is how many blocks are slipping at a time and log of nf, uh, n is the frequency here and nf is the magnitude. I mean, nf is the how many blocks are moving at one event and how many times that is happen happening, that is small n. Uh, begin here. And N0 is the total number. It's just to normalize it. So this is also giving us a power law type of behavior. And also if we plot the uh, energy release during this type of sleep events, we will get power law. Now, another concept is called SOC, self-organized criticality. Uh, people, some people believe that this Earth is a system that organizes itself to a critical state somehow. And then this type of events are happening. Uh, I mean, this earthquake, and that's why we are getting this power law. Because in physics, we believe that power law comes when you, we have long range correlation in the system. So this SOC, the concept of SOC is that Earth uh, somehow manages to reach a critical state. And when it reaches critical state, then this type of avalanche or earthquake happens with power law statistics. Now, there are some models based on this uh, SOC concept. It's called sand pile model. Uh, the first uh, set of models uh, introduced by B, T, W, this Buck, Tung, and Wiesenfeld. And this is called deterministic model. This is very simple, actually. In the 2D setup, as you can see, these, all the sites, they have a, I mean, cutoff that how, how much uh, sand grains they can hold. 
this cutoff for BTW model is four. And why it is deterministic? Because once a size reaches four, it will distribute its sand grains to all the nearest neighbor equally, one, one, and one in four. Okay, sorry. And this is how the model uh, dynamics goes. As you can see in the first place, all we, we can start with just empty cells here, and then we throw sand grains randomly to each cell. And now when this situation arises that three, 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 and three, three, and then one sand grains comes here in the middle, makes it four, but four, the model cannot tolerate or the site cannot tolerate four. So it will give one to all its nearest neighbor. So it becomes zero, but this two becomes four. You see, there is no periodic boundary conditions here. So when uh, this site is full, I mean four here, it will discharge the four, four grains. It will become zero and the nearest neighbors will get one grain each. So the grains which are going out in the upper direction, it, is, it will go out from the system. That's how this model goes. And uh, here avalanche means when you, you see, when one site reaches the threshold four, it's, they call it, it topples. So total number of toppling after you throw one sand grain in the model, this is, this will give us the size of avalanche in the system. And uh, there is one stochastic version of this sand pile model. This is called Manna model, introduced by SS Manna, uh, our seniors from Saha Institute. And he's now in uh, SN Bose Institute. So what he introduced that, okay, in this type of model, we can introduce stochasticity. If we say that only zero and one, these two states are possible. And when one uh, site becomes two, then among the four nearest neighbor, only two neighbor will get the extra sand grain. So that's how disorder or stochasticity has been introduced in this model. Now, the interesting thing is that if you simulate this system, the first one is BTW and the second one is Manna here, as you can see. Now, with time, we are recording the number of toppling, delta. So in the BTW model, initial stage, there is nothing. And then toppling starts and then it grows. At, after some time, it reaches here, I mentioned critical state. That means the average height in this system, it remains uh, almost same. It fluctuates around a value, but it uh, never goes up or goes down. This is called critical state. And the same with Manna model. Uh, it grows and reaches a critical state. Now, if you take the distribution of avalanches, at the critical state, both the models will give you power law distribution of this avalanche or bust site. So you see that we, this is very simple modeling, but at the end, they are also producing power law distribution in terms of avalanche site. Now, another set is uh, earthquake as a fracture propagation problem or fracture propagation model. I have given here two example that uh, one, the left side, as you can see that fractures uh, created by earthquake in New Zealand. So fractures uh, can be seen or, or earthquake can be seen as a large scale fracture propagation problem because uh, when plates are moving or large uh, masses are moving, they are creating fractures. And sometimes we can see the fractures from outside. Sometimes it's happening inside the crust. And here is one example of this uh, fault line in California. It's called San Andres Fault. And this is a very, very active seismic zone because the large scale fractures are there. 
and uh, associated movements and seismic events the it's it's very much uh, there now based on this concept that fracture propagation is associated to earthquake there are some modeling effort we know that this different uh, modes of this opening we know that there are mainly three modes a tensile mode the first one and uh, in plane shear it's like slip and then out of plane shear so it's a proper shear type of opening and together we have a concept here that stress field changes fracture but when fractures open up the stress field around the fractures they are again changing so there is a cycle going on here so whenever there are new fractures coming stress fields should be modified around the cracks or crack tip but that could again trigger more fracturing so when this cycle ends then it's a stable state so depending on these two scenarios that different modes of fracture opening and cycle of stress and uh, stress field and fracture opening there are some models and one mo such model is called fiber bundle model it's a very very simple and quite old model introduced in 1926 by peers he was a textile engineer and they were interested in finding the strength of a bundle of uh, fibers but later uh, daniels in 1945 did a lot of statistical analysis how to predict the strength if we know the distribution of the individual elements i mean what would be the strength of the whole bundle if you know the distribution of individual fibers so it was a very nice uh, approach by physicist there are different load shearing rules uh, first as you can see from the picture that there are two solid bars and fibers these parallel fibers are attached to these two bars and lower bar we are pulling the lower bar with some force or maybe a load is hanging here so in this setup all the fibers they should carry the load equally so this is called equal load sharing and that makes the model very simple and some analytic calculations are possible here but if you make this lower bar bit soft that means if some fiber fail here only the neighborhood will be affected then it's called local load sharing so whenever there are failure only the neighborhood is taking care of the extra load so fibers who are sitting far from this damage zone they are not affected that much but this simple change will make this model incredibly difficult to analyze uh, analytically and there are some other type of screen uh, load sharing uh, scheme called hierarchical scheme but uh, those are a bit complex model now in this uh, simple fiber bundle model there are different approaches how you load the system or how you apply the force so the first one or the oldest one is called quasi static loading that means you pull this lower bar very very uh, softly so that you ensure the weakest fiber will go or will fail fast so when there is a failure you stop pulling you allow the system to relax and come back to the stable state so you allow all the internal dynamics to happen and come back to the when the system is back to a stable state you pull it again but in loading in in uh, experiments uh, i i believe most of you are doing experiments in labs you know this is a very tricky thing i mean how do you know that uh, you are pulling so softly that you are breaking only one fiber at a time so sometimes we break many fibers so that's called loading by fixed amount 
I mean, in, in, in lab, we fix the amount like 10 grams at a time or 50 grams at a time, depending on our system. So in experiment, it's very, very difficult to follow quasi-static loading. Rather, it's fixed amount of loading is more usual. And the third case is when we are dealing with unknown sample, we don't know the uh, strength of the whole system. Sometimes we do overloading. That means we apply some initial load and that is above the strength of the whole system. So that is a overloaded situation. So the interesting thing is that in this simple model, you can actually analyze all these three way of loading because it's a democratic system. Whenever you put load, all the, bun all the fibers in the bundle will uh, carry the load equally. Now, from this concept, we can actually write down the force displacement equation here. So, as I mentioned, we have many, many fibers. So there must be a strength distribution. So this is small px is the distribution of fiber strength in the bundle. So the big P, it's a cumulative amount. So when you stretch uh, the bundle up to some amount zero uh, to Y, that means how many fibers will fail? You can just integrate the, your uh, distribution function up to zero from zero to Y. So this is the amount of failure when you uh, stretch your bundle up to Y. So from there, you can write the force equation that force in terms of x, x is now the strain. N is the initial number of fiber in the bundle. One minus Px. And there is a kappa here, spring content, constant or force constant. And x is the strain here. So this term, one minus Px, this is giving us this nonlinearity. When you plot it, sigma is the scaled force. We call it stress. Now, if we plot sigma with x, we'll get a parabola like safe. And here is the middle one is the average over like 100 sample. But if you take only one sample for different realizations, you will get this uh, with fluctuations, you can see. I think I run it for only 50 fibers. So once I got this, the upper curve, and next, uh, and the second realization, I got this one, the lower one. And then I averaged the curve over like 100 samples. And it's coming the, the middle one. That's the average cut. And that is actually what your theory will give you. Now, as you can see, this force has a maxima. So that is then this maximum point is the strength of the whole bundle. And it's easy to find it out. You just put df dx equal to zero in the equation. And then from the equation, you will get this relation, one minus big P of xc. xc is the point when this uh, maximum appearing, maximum of the force curve. And from this equation, it's easy to find out the critical point or the failure point if you know the distribution of fiber strength. So the simplest one, as you can see in the left-hand side, is a uniform distribution. So Px is one, Xr is one here. And uh, another in the right-hand side, it's a bull type of distribution because in material science, people mostly use bull distribution for material strength. So for both these distribution, it's, uh, you can easily calculate the failure point in terms of yours stretch. I mean, how much stretch you can apply up to the failure point of the whole bundle. Now, interesting thing is that uh, for quasi-static type of loading, when you are pulling your system very uh, softly, ensuring the weakest uh, link failure, you will get burst or avalanches. I mean, you break only one fiber, but due to load redistribution or stress redistribution, many more fibers are failing. So this is contributing to one avalanche or burst. So if we plot F with 
uh, stretch x we will get this type of curve and as you can see this dotted uh, horizontal lines they are actually giving you the amount of burst or avalanche now if you plot this avalanche uh, size distribution you will get a power law so the, this avalanche size distribution this is this is comparable to our uh, earthquake or seismic events because there there are small avalanches and at the end there are there is a huge avalanche that's uh, when the system collapses now in 1992 the my <clears throat> colleagues say, here in NTNU, two professors, Professor Hemmer and Professor Hansen, they made a, a nice theoretical analysis and proved theoretically that the distribution of avalanches will always give you a power law with exponent minus five by two. And here I plot uh, my simulation result with a bundle with uh, number of five or 10 to the power six and sample averaging I have done 20,000 times. Now, when I plot the data, the circles, and then I plotted the uh, predicted power law with uh, minus five by two exponent. As you can see, they are clearly matching very nicely. Now, this uh, simple model allow us to do some more calculation to solve the dynamics of this type of failure. Because you see, when you break one or few uh, fibers, they can trigger more breaking. So there is a recursive dynamics here. We can actually write it down or formulate it through this uh, in terms of the time steps. I mean, here time steps mean step of load redistribution. So if you call UT is the number of unbroken fiber at time step T, then you can write it down as an equation relating the UT plus one with UT. So UT plus one is one minus P, this cumulative amount, sigma by UT. Now, when you write this type of equation, it's easy to go and find out the fixed point or stable point when ut plus one and ut are same. So we call it fixed point. You put it ut plus one equal to ut equal to u star. And for uniform distribution, you will get a quadratic equation and you can solve it actually. And from this solution, you will get the critical value of your sigma. Not only that, you can actually define order parameter susceptibility and also you'll get the behavior of relax relaxation time so we have checked this uh, scheme not only for uniform distribution also for general power of type of distribution or viable distribution and all in all these distribution they are following similar type of form i mean order parameter goes to zero following a power law with exponent half Susceptibility also diverges at the critical point or critical stress with exponent minus half. And relaxation time also diverges with, with exponent minus half. Now this uh, we published in FIGREV with uh, my professor uh, Chakraborty and uh, my senior Prati Bhattacharya in 2001 and two. Now I have uh, come to the final part of uh, my uh, presentation, some lab experiments. So I was in uh, Sintep Petroleum Research uh, in Trondheim for nine years, where they used to do a lot of rock uh, fracturing test, because you know that petroleum products, they are coming out of these rocks. So it's very important to know the strength of the rock to planning drilling operations or some uh, fracturing uh, operation to extract more and more uh, petroleum out of rocks. So from one of such uh, fracture experiments, I collected all the uh, 
cracking events and well, these cracking events are coming at acoustic emissions i mean when you crack a sample or a rock uh, it produces a sound uh, and this cracking sound they are actually with some acoustic emission recorder you can record them so this is the setup in the left side uh, a rock sample and inside the rock sample there is a hole and through this hole, we are actually injecting fluid and uh, creating a borehole pressure or borehole stress that could eventually break or create some fracture in the system. And in the, uh, in the figure below, I have shown how all the acoustic sensors are placed around the sample to catch all the acoustic sample, uh, acoustic emission events or signals. And when we plot with time, uh, this is the, uh, all the green dots, they are acoustic emission events. And uh, this red line is how we are increasing the pressure on the system. And the black line is the confining pressure uh, applied on the, the whole setup to keep everything tight and nice. So the amplitude, uh, this is the, the decibel a unit we have plotted here as you can see as we come to the the final fracturing or collapse point there are a lot of the densely uh, located events here and there are high amplitude events acoustic events now uh, the this experiment can be done in a different way but in simpler way also this is one that uh, as you can see a rock sample here and all these black things are acoustic emission uh, transducers or recorders. Or you can just uh, compress the rock to break it. And this is a, a part of the acoustic emission system with uh, computers and uh, data acquisition techniques uh, setups here. Now, uh, finally, when we crack the rock, we, we, we uh, took the post-test uh, picture of the fracture lines. And we tried to match it with what we got actually from these acoustic emission recorders. As you can see, this left one is the, uh, the directly taken from acoustic emission panel, the recorder panel. You can see all the marks are on the position of acoustic emission sensors. One, two, three, four, like this spiral way we have uh, put it and all these dots they are indicating the major fracture path and when you compare it with the actual fracture lines on your sample it's, it's, it is very nicely actually capturing the orientation and finally we we looked at the amplitude distribution in such a uh, fracturing test so this is the log of uh, amplitude and this is the log distribution of amplitude and amplitude. And there are two different types of uh, uh, rocks we have chosen. One is sandstone. This is quite uh, uh, strong. And chalk samples, they are quite weak samples. But in both of the cases, we have got this type of straight line when we plot them in semi-log. And also acoustic energy distribution, they are giving us uh, power law distribution as we get in other models and also according to this Gutenberg rock predictor things. Uh, these are not earthquakes clearly, but these are small micro seismic events, but still they are following power law statistics. This is for sandstone and this one is for chalk. And uh, uh, for another two, samples we have checked this castle gate rock and mount simon uh, rocks we got two different uh, power laws at the end when the rocks are actually sliding from each other the major fractures opened up and then two parts are sliding that time we received large events with very high energy and they are following a different type of power law but still they are power law so I think I used all my times. Let us uh, point out 
uh, something that I wanted to focus on that models are based on few aspects. You cannot expect everything from simple models. So as physicists, we always try to make simple models. And in some, in some cases, we can even solve them, solve the dynamics or something. So the first principle is to secure qualitative agreement. And next, we can include more parameters if uh, we have uh, that capacity. So I want to emphasize that new way of thinking and expressing your doubts, they are really important for your research progress. So today, a lot of students are here. So I really expect that if you ask questions, that is not only uh, helpful for me, that I think it, it is important for, for starting a discussion to trigger some new way of thinking. So new thinking are very much welcome and important for research. But whatever models we discuss, they are in small scales, as you can see, tabletop models. But the real earthquake, as uh, Vice Principal uh, already mentioned, that challenges are a lot. Why physics is uh, uh, lagging behind? Why we don't have any answer for earthquake predictions? This is a complex problem. But as physicists, we always try to understand the dynamics and to understand the basics, whatever is possible with our capability. And here comes this upscaling issue. I mean, whatever you are getting from small, uh, small scale models, can you really upscale it? Can you predict something in the field scale at the end? That is really challenging and we need coordinated effort. And it, 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 it is not only uh, the job of researcher, I mean, from one field, sometimes it's important to talk to people from seismology, from geology, because they are also dealing with a lot of models for understanding or predicting earthquake. So thank you very much. I will stop here and I will be happy to discuss if uh, some questions or comments uh, you, you will have on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradhan, for your beautiful presentation with explanation and clarity. Professor Pradhan has no, please, please, please don't call me pro Sorry. professor. <laughs> okay, <Yeah. laughs> Dr. Pradhan has uh, defined certain basic terminology related to the earthquake, then Gutenberg Richter law, aftershock Omori law, and several models, fractal overlap models, bodies no pop model, and then some models related to self organized criticality, sand pile model, and then BTW model, which is det the deterministic one. And it is, we are very excited to announce that he also has also discussed the Manna model, the stochastics one, then fracture propagation model, fiber bundling model. And at the end, he has mentioned some experiment related to this. So we are very happy to hear from you, Dr. Pradhan. Now I am handing over this micro microphone to Professor Joita Choudhury. And I request the participant to write down your questions on the chat box. Professor Choudhury will now conduct the question and answer session. Professor Choudhury, please. Sudarshita, you can see in the chat section, there are few questions. You can read those questions and answer. Mm, chat section, uh, okay, let me. The right hand. Yeah, the, right yeah right this, this, is, this is the. Yes, yes. Okay. Why in VTW model the fourth figure have upper left corner five? Okay. 
let me go back to my presentation yes i uh, fourth upper left con corner five yes that one, yes. That one. yes because because it was four before right it was four before but it received one from the neighbor let me see yeah it's a uh, it is four when it four then this one is four this one is four this one is three and this one is one okay then what happens this four okay first we are toppling this one when we topple this one this should because become zero this is three and this is uh, one and yes yes you can see that now when in the in figure in the step three we we are toppling this side now so when this side topples it becomes zero so all its neighbors will get one sand grain so this one is five three three becomes four first okay this is four first and then this one is it was zero it will get one it's two it's get uh one more so three and when uh, okay it and then this point it becomes this four becomes five no, right no 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 this that, this that four becomes zero and zero and uh, yeah yeah one point. comes yes. from yes, yes yes this four becomes zero and one came from uh, yeah from this point one came here so yes it becomes four oh okay now this uh, this site is getting one from right and one from below that's yeah. why it's becoming five yeah mm. yes and then let me go back to chat uh, yeah how does if bbm apply to plate tectonics is the plate holding the cross like string holding the... okay fbm is not for plate tectonics because plate based on plate tectonics we only discussed this fractal overlap models right and fbm is for this fracture propagation type of modeling it's it's not related to plate tectonics I think the plates are losing must again retain in original state and hold the crust. So it's in the fair strings. Yes, uh, load redistribution will always be there whenever there are some failure in fiber bundle model. Because as you can see, these models, uh, all the remaining fibers should support the load right so whenever there are failure the remaining the stress on the remaining fiber they will increase so there will be stress redistribution uh, is there any incorporation of the earth's rotation into the earthquake models well there must be many many models but as i said that i wanted to discuss only some basics models where physics, uh, physical principles are involved and uh, where we can explain or at the end we will recover this Gutenberg-Richter type of loss. But you are right, there must be many, many different on comp complex models, seismological models and geological models. But I'm not aware of those things. So what I wanted to cover the basic models that I know or the way I understood them. And another question is, uh, let me see, is there any, uh, okay. And then it should become zero again. Yes, you mean this uh, number is BTW model? 
I think he was mentioning BTW model again. So after get uh, after becoming five, it will become zero. No, no, no. It it will give away only four sand grains because it's deterministic one. Only four nearest neighbor will get the uh, extra grains. So it's now now releasing only four. So it's keeping one. That's why it's one here. It will not go to zero because if you release all the five grains, then one nearest neighbor will get two. That is not possible in BTW setup. Yes, but now not know how it becomes five. Because it becomes five, it was three before, and then it got one grain from right hand side and one grain from the side below it. So it added up to five. Is it right, Jit? It's a question from Jit Majumdar. You are asking how it became five, right? Jit, can you unmute your uh, device and can you please? Jit, please unmute yourself. We can't hear you, Jit, if you have some questions or comments. It should then immediately give away one. Give give away one from five. You mean? No. When you when you cross the threshold, threshold is four here. If you reach the threshold four, you immediately release all the four grains. But if because of, this is a sequential, and this is a problem of sequential updating. I mean, how you update your system, because if you do one by one, then sometimes the one site is getting sand grains from neighbors and becoming more than four. So you have to allow it. And then when you reduce, you, when you come to that particular site, here it's having five grains. When you come to that site, you release the four and keep the extra one with it. Is it clear, Jit? He has written all right. Oh, oh okay. He he can't unmute. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Yes, I think uh, in the chat. Uh, Another question more. by Chandrima yeah. Sengupta. Uh, what is Chandrima Seng? Yeah, how many uh, hours are typically needed for bean sites? Thanks. What type of modeling you are mentioning, Chandrima? Uh, because you know, you know this uh, sand pile models. If you increase the system size, I mean, hundred by hundred system is typically it's it's okay to to go with. But if you want like ten thousand by ten thousand size, then you will need more computational power. So uh, I, I don't have a, a concrete answer to your question, how, how many GPU or CPU hours you need, but because nowadays people are using parallel computation. And if you have many, many cores uh, available, then you can parallelize your code and uh, you can reduce the computation time um, by, by, by um, I mean, seeing considerable, considerable amount. I mean, it depends how many nodes you, can use in your uh, parallel code. But you see, these are simple models. If you want to check the qualitative, uh, you know, this avalanche distribution and all in, in your own laptop or a, a, your PC is enough to uh, run the code in considerable size like 100 by 100 or 500 by 500 square lattice. And bean size, if, if it, you are mentioning averaging thing, it's you are free to choose the bean size. I mean, it depends on your uh, the the avalanche size limit. I mean, 
if toppling uh, toppling the maximum toppling you say that if you have uh, 5000 the biggest toppling size then according to that you can define your bean size for your sample size averaging that you have to check and figure out please explain the exact analogy between 5vm and the fracture lines if possible yeah fracture lines well in fiber bundle model what i mentioned that it's there are small fracturing events means failure of few fibers and then it's gradually approaching a state where collapse of the system is happening so in that sense it's a the, in this simple model you cannot get this fracture lines but if you modify this model and and include this local load sharing thing then in 2d in 2d case you can see the fracture lines because now you are dealing with the geometry of crack tip and how it propagates so there you will get a nice crack tip and crack line but in in equal load sharing it's like if you know percolation the way of breaking is like percolation i mean stress field is same everywhere so depending on, only on the strength of the fibers you are breaking one by one so space is uh, not a matter here so it's the system is correlated in that sense so if you if you know the uh, pattern of percolation i mean if, if you consider site percolation and one by one you are uh, filling the site so you will get a cluster of filled sites so in if you compare that with with fiber bundle setup in a 2d model you are breaking points or fibers one by one in different sites so you will get exactly the similar pattern like percolation because there is uh, similarity in the way we are filling the percolating sites and in the way we are breaking the uh, fibers in in uh, in fiber bundle model i think no more yes. questions are there okay okay so okay. move up to our head of the department so okay uh, dr pradhan i have a question yes please so how do you define the size Mm -hmm. in your first in your first uh, slides uh, when you were discussing with gr law mm -hmm. the x axis there was a parameter m yes, yes. so how do uh, you define this, that m this, this this m is the gutenberg richter scale no no you know the, you mentioned a size there some size yeah yeah that's that size is actually this gutenberg richter scale you know oh. we call it 6.5 7.5 all these things uh -huh. Uh -huh. so this m is actually this gutenberg richter m uh, this m yes 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 this m is the gutenberg richter scale so here it's seven means earthquake of seven seven, seven richter scale oh so now yeah oh, yeah i, I agree that, yeah that is the side i i was trying to relate with some of the events events mm -hmm. Not okay this is the magnitude this is the, this magnitude. Is the magnitude yeah yeah, yeah. that's sorry, sorry. yeah uh -huh. so uh, i think there is no question uh, then i uh, i request the participants just should just to see the link given in the chat box please provide the feedback after giving you the feedback you will get something there so now it's time to present vote of thanks so again i congratulate dr pradhan for giving beautiful lecture and congratulation to the principal of our college vice principal of our college iqsc coordinator and ex teachers of the department our colleagues register participants students for 
being present here in this international webinar and to make it a grand success i congratulate you again so thank you very much for being with us in this international webinar thank you yeah thank you uh, i have a message for the students if okay. if you want to ask me something or you are all welcome and please get my email address from joita or professor nondi you can contact me directly i will be more than happy to discuss with you as i mentioned that we need new thinking we need that people express their doubts so that we can we can think and we can take uh, some other way of explaining the same thing to different people i mean this is this is all i mean towards the progress of research and science sometimes when we work for long time in a field we are so much uh, in our own balloon that we <laughs> we think everything okay whatever we are thinking maybe people will understand but it's it's good to challenge your thinking i mean that's what only students can do i mean they are coming from fresh thinking and i ap appreciate your all your comments criticism and questions thank you thank you so let us come to an end joita okay so okay bye bye sutarchi okay thank you thank you very ah. much ah. thank you joita yeah bye i am leaving bye. now okay yeah. thank you thank you